Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and welcome to another half hour of libertarian discourse and debate. Now, the uh, Taxpayer Bill of Rights is a concept that some of you may have heard of, some of you may not, but um, it has been floated around in several states over the past decade and a half or so. In 1992, the state of Colorado passed a version of it, which the Wall Street Journal called the gold standard of taxpayer bills <coughs> of rights. Since then, the state of Washington has also passed a um, similar, if somewhat watered down version, and apparently taxpayer bills of rights are being looked at in several other states as well. Now, with me tonight to discuss the concept is Jeffrey Shapiro, who is legislative director of the New York State Libertarian Party. Um, Jeffrey, maybe you can just start out by telling us, because I have a feeling that a lot of our viewers have never heard of it, what is the Taxpayer Bill of Rights and what rights does it enumerate? Sure. Well, in a nutshell, Joe, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is a means by which uh, the state government is limited in the amount of spending it can do. Well, actually, I should say it's limited, it limits spending by limiting the amount of revenue the, ta the government can take in. Now, there's three major points to it. The first says that the amount of revenue a state or local government can take in is limited by a formula of the rate of inflation uh, in the state, in the case of the state government. Okay, plus, but let me stop you right sure, here. Sure, go ahead. You, in most states, in most states, then could a uh, government theoretically tax you on 100 percent of your income and 100 percent of your personal assets? Uh, I mean, is there no limit in most states? In most states, no, there is no limit. Uh, it is whatever the uh, the state decides to set as a tax rate. So, um, and not just, and I should say, not just income. Of course, there's all the attendant. Uh, Fees and uh, and uh, user. So in things. theory, you could be literally taxed until you have nothing but the clothes on your back. Well, that seems to be the ultimate goal. Yes. Okay. So would the um, taxpayer bill of rights uh, limit the amount of taxation that a state could impose to a certain number or a certain percentage of your income or a certain percentage of your total wealth or what? Well, it doesn't go by a certain percentage of income. What it does is it takes the takes the current year's tax as a base, the amount of revenues taken in. Not the amount that is, not the tax rate itself, but the amount of revenues taken in. Okay. For the next year's, for the next year, the amount of revenues the state came in can be, takes in, can be only be limited by uh, that base, plus a formula based on inflation, okay. plus the um, the increase in population. Okay, of so the state. one of the one of the rights enumerated in the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is that the state can only tax you to a certain extent. It's not. A, it's it's. See, this is a diff, This is something a distinction that has to be made. It's not the amount of taxation. It's the amount of revenues taken in. I and see. that brings us to the second point, which is, if the state has a very good year. Uh, everybody's business does well, everybody gets a lot of raises, the state takes in more money than is, uh, than that number, than the number set, the state must give everybody in the state a refund on their taxes. Now, in the years 1997 to 2002, which is the last year for which numbers are available, the people of Colorado got back $3.2 billion over those five years, um, which amounts to about $800 per capita, or $3,200 for a family of four. Okay, that's not too bad. No. Uh, so tell me where are some of the other rights that we would have under this bill? Well, the third provision is that um, the state could not, the state government cannot increase taxes or impose uh, or, or acc accumulate debt without direct voter approval. So you're ba it's basically limiting, limiting, it's basically cutting the government off the source is what it is. It just doesn't give them the money to spend. Now when you add to that, this isn't part of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, but Colorado also has a balanced budget provision in its constitution and uh, a few years before the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, there was a provision enacted in the state 
which says that the total amount, now here we go into the, the amount of taxation, cannot increase more than 6% in any one year. So this, the state government in Colorado is really in a tight bind when it comes to both getting money and spending it. Okay, so the Taxpayer Bill of Rights then limits the amount of revenue that a government can uh, collect and it also limits increases. Correct. Okay, and uh, you can't um, float debt or add new taxes without a direct referendum of the voters. Correct. Does that cover it or are there other provisions? No, that's base those are the basic provisions, yes. Okay, and has this been introduced in the state of New York? Unfortunately, no. The closest we have is, well, there are two bills out there right now, well, in the last session, since we're going into a new session. Both of those were simply provisions which limited the amount of, uh, of revenue to um, the amount of increase in personal income, which some people have floated at. It's, it's an extremely watered down version. It's the state government trying to make it seem like they're doing something when they're really not. The reason being that inflation plus population increase is always it's considerably less okay. than, uh, than the increase in personal income. Okay, now let's look at this from a libertarian perspective. A lot of libertarians of my acquaintance would say, hey, look, there shouldn't be any taxes anyway. This, mm -hmm. is, uh, this is just not really even scratching the surface of what we've got to do with um, about right. the government's power uh, to collect revenue. Some people would say we've got to just um, gut the entire operation. Right. What do you say to them? Well, I say that you got to take things one at a time, okay? The, the pub, well, in, in, t in general terms, in the big picture, the public is not ready for something like that. We've been, the American people for the last at least 50 years, depending on when you want to put it, when you want to put it first, some people put it back to Lincoln's administration, but the American people have grown more and more accustomed to the government doing things for them, the federal government doing things for them and the state governments. Um, so to just go cold turkey, I don't think simply is going to happen. What the Taxpayer Bill of Rights does is it starts to put the brakes on. Uh, the analogy I like to use with people is before you go into reverse, you have to stop going forward. You have to slow down, then stop, then start to back up. This, this puts the brakes on. Okay, so what is your strategy for getting this bill introduced into the New York legislature and getting it passed? Well, that's something uh, the political people on the committee are going, on the uh, state committee are going to have to start to work out, and of course I'll be doing it with them. Um, one of the things we're going to try and do is pedal it around to legislators. See, the problem we have in New York State is we have no process of initiative. Um, we, we have no way to, get, to do an end run around the state legislators. So we're going to have to find existing incumbents who are at least moderately sympathetic to the cause. Um, other than that, uh, New York has a significantly uphill fight. Okay. Now, another point on which some libertarians might disagree with you is the idea of referendum and initiative. Some of us are just not enthusiastic about direct democracy because as bad as an elected legislature is, um, the, the mass of the people can sometimes be even more vicious and stupid. What well, do you say to that? Well, I share that. I share that uh, proposal. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that Colorado has faced. Um, a few years after, I think it was, it, the, the uh, Tabor was enacted in 1992. In 2000, uh, the voters of Colorado fell for the education lobby's blandishments and voted in a provision that says that state education spending has to increase by the rate of inflation plus one point. So now you've got education increasing 
the rest of the state budget on hold. What hap what's been happening for the oh last five Lord, years. Lord, I had no idea. Yes, what's been happening in Colorado for the last five years is education has been sucking up more and more of the state budget with no end in sight. And of course, it's all public education, which doesn't really teach kids much of anything except how to uh, bow to authority. Absolutely. Well, the good thing, the, the good side of it is not for the people of Colorado, but for the rest of us, as, as Justice Brandeis said, uh, states are the laboratories of democracy. So now the rest of the states who are considering Tabor see what happened in Colorado and they're trying to learn from that mistake. Okay. So if we could break away from this issue for just a moment and have us uh, tell you a little about yourself and about the New York State Libertarian Party, I think that would be great. Now, um, you're a lawyer, I understand, and you That's were correct. for a while with the city attorney's office in the town of Newburgh, correct? City of Newburgh, yes. City of Newburgh? Correct. Okay. And uh, what's your gig now? Well, I'm working for a state agency, but which I don't want to name just because they have these funky rules about being identified, nothing that comes out of my mouth should be considered uh, uh, anything uh, that the agency or the state government itself. Okay, so you're uh, a state government on. employee, but correct. you're also a libertarian. That's correct. That's unusual. Well, got to have moles every place, don't you? I suppose you? so. You're darn right. <laughs> well, how did you happen to come to libertarianism? Uh, it's been something that's been on my mind for a long time. Uh, I'd read about it. I'd, I'd looked into it. Um, I always had a lot of sympathy for it, but I had been a died, died in the wool Republican, had been one since I was 18, ran the Reagan campaign on my college campus, was a town committeeman, went to the, uh, went to the state convention, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the uh, 2000 convention as an alternate delegate. Um, the Republican Party, over the last few years is not the party I joined. It has not be, it is not, it has turned into another party. Uh, right, Ronald Reagan once said that he, he, a former New Deal Democrat, left the, it says he didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left him. And that's how I feel about the Republican Party. Okay, so uh, as legislative director of the uh, New York Libertarian Party, can you tell me what are your hopes at this point for the state Libertarian Party. Is it going to supplant or at least equal one of the uh, two major parties? Well, I think that both of the major parties are due for a serious meltdown at some time in the future. Um, the, state, uh, the state Republican Party is, is a joke. Uh, you know, they, they, can't, uh, they can't field decent candidates anymore. Look at the last two candidates for senator. Um, they still have no idea who's going to run for governor if Governor Pataki doesn't, doesn't run for another term. Uh, the Democrats are falling into the, uh, the, left, the, the far end of the left wing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that voters are going to get real tired real soon, tired of the extremism, tired of the partisan bickering, and they're going to start looking for alternatives. Okay, now, well, one problem that I keep encountering when I tell people that I'm a, a libertarian, that I'm running for office on the libertarian ticket and so on, is that they have never heard of us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our viewers out here, I dare say, are not quite clear on what libertarians are. I mean, a mm. lot of people, when you say libertarian, they think, oh, he wants to legalize marijuana. Other than that, he's just a good mainstream Democrat. Don't forget about guns. <laughs> oh, oh, well, in that case, then he must be a good mainstream Republican, except right. that he wants you to have guns. Exactly. So people have these ideas. And you've got uh, idiots like Bill Maher going around calling himself a libertarian when, in fact, he's just a, mm -hmm. a left-wing Democrat who wants to legalize pot. Right. And people are just getting the totally wrong impression. So maybe you could tell our readers just in very simple terms what is a libertarian and what is not a libertarian. A libertarian believes in freedom. That, that is the core of the whole thing. Libertarians believe that you have the right to do anything you want to do that does not hurt anybody else. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, people have, I've, I've heard it said that the Republicans are the, the daddy party and the Democrats are the mommy party. As a matter of fact, I think I coined that uh, 
expression back when I ran for Congress in 2002, if I recall. Good, good. It's, it's a useful analogy. Uh, to expand that a little more, people say the Republicans uh, are for security and for rules and, and limits, and therefore they're the daddy party. The Democrats want to nurture and, and, could, and take care of people, and that's why they're the mommy party. I like to think of libertarians as the next door neighbor party. We, we're, not, we're not interested in controlling you in any way. As long as you keep, keep your, uh, your dog off our lawn, we can, you can do anything you want. And keep your noise down after 10 o'clock. You can do whatever, as wh whatever you please on your own property. Okay. And uh, if you'd like to find out more about the uh, Libertarian Party, I suggest that you visit the website of the Manhattan Libertarian Party, which is www.manhattanlp.org, and there you will find basic information about the Libertarian Party. You will also find links to the um, state and the national websites. And um, Jeffrey, maybe you can uh, tell people about the uh, state Libertarian Party website and the state party's structure and, uh, and so forth, and tell people a little about how they can uh, get more involved in libertarian activities if they would like to, or find out more about the party at least. Certainly. The website, I believe, is www.lp.org, uh, lpny.org. Um, and, uh, well, the basic structure, we have, we have a growing organization. Uh, our goal right now is to establish state uh, county committees in every county in the state. And uh, my phone number is on the website if anybody from Green anybody knows anybody in Green County who wants to, uh, who wants to join up. Um, we are getting candidates together for all the races that are open this year, including yourself. Uh, we are um, putting together a legislative package for candidates. I'm taking the, uh, the initiative on that. There'll be Tabor, there'll be something to address the abominable uh, Kelo decision, uh, taking away our property rights, and, uh, and a few, three or four other ones that'll be good for libertarians. Okay, now you are the uh, legislative director of the state organization, so maybe you can tell us about some of the other legislative initiatives that you are either pushing now or that you hope to introduce in the future. Well, I've, I've just finished drafting a bill that, uh, that we're going to start moving around to people, uh, setting forth exactly what public use is in the state. Right now, New York, even before Kelo, said that uh, the courts have said that public use means you can take away somebody's property for any purpose, even economic development. Uh, Utah has an excellent uh, has an excellent piece of legislation that's been in place, which limits exact delineates exactly what public use is, and specifically says that it's not for for economic development. It's not to raise the state's tax base. I have cribbed considerably from Utah's language, and we'll try and get that into New York State law. Uh, we've also got a provision, uh, we're also going to be putting together a provision for a constitutional amendment uh, granting the right to keep and bear arms to people in the state of New York. Right now, New York State's constitution has no provision for the right to keep and bear arms. It's strictly statutory. Okay, now that's where a lot of uh, people who consider themselves liberals part company with the Libertarian Party. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, we're uh, all with you on drugs. We're with you on uh, letting people be gay if they want to. We're mm -hmm. with you on letting people have abortions if they want to. But guns are evil. Guns kill. What do you say to these folks? Well, I'd say that you have to look at history. Uh, it's not for nothing that, that, the, that uh, the right to keep and bear arms is the Second Amendment ranking right after the First Amendment. That's because guns historically have been the symbol of a free of a free person. Uh, uh, slaves could not own guns, uh, could not have weapons. I mean, we're going back into into common law now. Serfs could not own weapons. Indentured servants could not own weapons. Only free people could own weapons uh, and use them. Um, the the best. The best guarantee, or one of the best guarantees, of a person's liberty is the right to keep and bear arms. 
uh, the right to defend himself, the right to, to keep himself and his, and his loved ones safe, if necessary, okay. instead of relying on the state to do it for him. Very good point, and I agree with you 100%. What is going to be the strategy for getting this legislation through the uh, New York State uh, Assembly and Senate? Well, once again, we're going to have to look for sympathetic, uh, sympathetic legislators. Uh, there'll be a lot more of them sympathetic to, to gun rights than to, uh, than to Tabor, of course, especially in, in the upstate areas. Uh, what we're also going to put into that bill is a provision saying that uh, it's no longer going to depend on the discretion of the local, uh, local constabulary, whether or not you get a gun or not. Uh, right now, you can apply for a license or a gun permit. However, it's up to pretty much the local police chief whether that's going to be granted. We're going to change that and make a provision setting forth specific criteria for the permit, just like a driver's license. If you meet those criteria, you get the permit. Uh -huh. And what would those criteria be? Well, we haven't, well, I haven't completely worked that out yet, but it'll be pretty much, uh, what I'm thinking is pretty much uh, age and no criminal record. Okay, sounds good to me, but um, a really a hardcore libertarian would say, wait a minute, how about convicted felons? Don't they have a right to defend themselves also? And uh, should they be placed at the mercy of criminal types who are liable to prey on them because they know they're not armed? Well, I think it depends on what type of felony for which they've been convicted. Uh, I don't think we want to give violent criminals uh, the chance to do it again, whereas nonviolent uh, it's a, it's a matter of policy that we're going to have to have to think about. Well, that just uh, brings up a, a point that I always have to remind people of when I'm trying to convert them to libertarianism. You have to explain to them that, no, a libertarian society will probably not be perfect, and we are going to have these um, conflicting issues just as uh, people of other political parties mm -hmm. have to face. Uh, we are not the, um, the final answer but we're a lot closer to it than the Demoblicans or the Republicans. Well, see, that's, that's the point I use when I try and talk to people about it. Uh, the 20th century, I think, demonstrated uh, quite forcefully the dangers of utopian movements. Uh, communism, fascism, socialism, all of those well, were going to make... Well, and also what we uh, know as progressivism, which sounds very nice and very soft True and very kind-hearted, but anyone who calls himself a progressive, um, if I were allowed to own a gun, I would reach for it. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, progressivism, to my mind, invariably means more authority for the state, more oppression, more taking away of individual rights, more legislation True. of private behavior. That's it. Uh, Robert Heinlein, I think, once said that uh, people divide politically into two groups, those who want to have control over people and those who have no such desire. Exactly so, and guess which type of person invariably runs for public office and gets elected? Exactly. So how can we persuade libertarians who just want to be left alone to make the tremendous sacrifice of um, launching a political campaign and actually working hard enough and raising enough money to get elected? That's not easy. No, it's not. And, and we're going to, we in the party, state party, are going to be thinking about that. We basically just want people to get out, make their make their opinions known, uh, start start speaking up, start saying as as the man said in the movie, well, "I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore." Okay, I think that's a fine idea. Um, can you um, give us an idea of how the Libertarian Party would go about? Um, well. Probably we wouldn't redistribute the wealth, but a lot of people find that a stumbling block with us. They say, well, you want the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer. Do we? No. Or, um, and would we, in fact, redistribute the wealth given power, or would we uh, allow the, uh, the poor to sink, as some critics would say we would? Well, I think one of the major problems you have uh, that, that causes people to be poor is they're not allowed to use their natural talents. They're not. They're kept down by government regulation, government uh, government controls. 
businesses are using, using valuable resources and valuable capital to comply with that literally millions of state and federal state and federal regulations if these if that capital was used to to create infrastructure to create jobs then there would be there would be considerably more jobs and considerably more opportunities for wealth to get back to Tabor for a minute because this ties into to the taxpayer bill of rights um, Colorado has seen a substantial move of, of, of money in the state from the public to the private sector as a result of Tabor. And as a result of that, Cal, uh, Colorado has had an explosion of jobs uh, and private sector jobs. You, it, before Tabor, 19, before that in 1992, the, the fastest growing industry in Colorado was government. Now, government employment is at the lowest rate of increase, and private sector jobs surpass it. That's great. Well, wonderfully. Maybe it's, it's no wonder then that uh, the most libertarian TV show uh, in common use these days, South Park, comes out of Colorado. <laughs> and it is a good libertarian show, yes. It is indeed. Um, I think that we've got on the whole to. Um, banish certain misconceptions about libertarians. Uh, another one that I hear a lot is, well, libertarians feel that if you see a child drowning in a creek, you shouldn't jump in after him. I don't know where they get that idea, but I no. I don't know either. Uh, what we say is, no, we should jump in and rescue the kid. We should not rely on a government agency to do it. That's exactly right. We shouldn't have to fill out a form before or after we do it either. Exactly so. And that I think pretty much wraps up our show for tonight, but uh, we wish you luck, Jeffrey Shapiro, on your um, efforts to get a taxpayer bill of rights through the New York State Legislature. We're sure you're going to do it sooner or later. Thank you. And for tonight, that's it. I'm Joseph Dobrian. Good night from Hard Fire. But guns are evil. Guns kill. What do you say to these folks? Well, I'd say that you have to look at history. Uh, it's not for nothing that, that, the, that uh, the right to keep and bear arms is the Second Amendment, ranking right after the First Amendment. That's because guns, historically, have been the symbol of a free, of a free person. Uh, uh, slaves could not own guns, or could not have weapons. I mean, we're going back into into common law now. Serfs could not own weapons, indentured servants could not own weapons, only free people could own weapons.